more than sufficient to offset what you're charging them for the program, considering the effectiveness in reducing costs associated with behavioral health problems, right? So that's the logic. That's what we're trying to try to do here in the presentation is explain that. Well, let's use an example. Let's suppose your um, PEPM, that's your rate you're charging, is $2. It could be anything. It could be any currency. It doesn't matter. But I just use dollars just for the sake of simplicity. So let's suppose your PEPM is $2 per month. So, um, so in other words, and let's suppose this company, this magical company, has 1,000 employees. So what you're charging them every month is $2,000, right? Or $24,000 per year. That's what they're paying you. Okay. Well, let's suppose that there's a prevalence rates of issues in your country, and that varies country to country. The prevalence rate always is different. But in the, in the United States, it's around 20%. So let's choose the 20%. So let's suppose that the employees in the company have a prevalence rates of issues of about 20%. That means of the 2,000, uh, that means that of the 1,000 employees, 200 of them will have issues, right? And these issues will lead to loss of work performance, you know, presentism and absenteeism and all that, right? So let's suppose 200 are, is the audience. It's the, the, the maximum of individuals in the company that will have issues. Okay, now let's suppose that the utilization rate for these uh, 200 employees is 5%. That means 50, uh, 50 employees will use the EAP, right? Which is 5% of the 1,000 uh, employees. So the question is, can the soft savings, the cost savings from these 50 employees, the 50 users, be more than sufficient to cover that $24,000 per year? That is the question that the, the, the chief financial officer or the decision maker is making. They don't say it this way, but that's what they're thinking. They think more amorphously. They think, gee, not many people use it and we're paying all this money, right? So they, but they don't know of all the few that use it, comparatively few that use it, is it more than enough, the savings more than enough to generate the cost? And some people doubt it because if you think about a football team, right? A football team that only wins 5% of its games has to be the worst football team on earth, right? So when you think about 5%, you're thinking of a very low number. It can't be that good. What you find in behavioral health, you will find that even if a few people use it, the benefit to the company is so great there's more than sufficient to offset the cost. And what I'm going to do is in the next few minutes is show you that and how we calculate that. So first we have to ask ourselves, which types of costs are impacted by an EAP? Well, let's use some common sense here and things that we all know. People who have employee related issues, employee assistance programs related issues, right? They're distracted about their relationships. They have a substance abuse problem. Um, uh, these types of financial issues, right? Legal issues. They're distracted, obviously. You know, obviously they're distracted. So sometimes when someone leaves a company because they broke their leg, it's obvious. They left the company, they broke their leg, so they're no longer sitting at their desk working. But when it comes to behavioral issues, people just don't leave the company. Some do, but the majority just sit there and wonder and worry. That's the same thing as leaving the company, but it's not so obvious, right? because people can't have trouble quantifying presentism. They're easily quantify absenteeism. The person is not at their desk. But what about presentism, being distracted? So they think, ah, oh, it's impossible. We can't possibly do that, so let's forget about it. And I'll explain in the next few slides how you calculate the cost of, of presentism. So let's jump to another type of cost, turnover cost. Well, as I mentioned, some people do indeed leave their employer. Let's suppose a woman became a single mother all of a sudden because of divorce. Well, she leaves the company to take care of her employee, uh, to care, take care of her kids, or work for a job that's more flexible, say, and so she can take care of her kids. So, what is the problem for the employer? Well, they have to replace Mary, right? She left the company. So now, we, what you have to do is recruit the person. That costs money. You got to place an ad. You've got to got to interview new people. You got to train the new person, right? So there's a cost to the employer due to these, uh, due to people leaving the company due to an EAP related issue. And also let's think about other types of costs, an accident. If you're dealing with a mining company, an accident is really expensive. But if a person is simply a teller at a bank, what are they gonna do, cut their finger with a paper clip? So it might be a band-aid, right? 
But there are accidents, and some accidents are very expensive, and some accidents are very minor in expenses. And that depends on what? The industry they're in. So in an industry where accidents cost a lot of money because of distraction, the cost is very high. And in other industries where the cost of an injury could be very minor, such as the bank teller who cuts her finger or his finger with a paperclip, right? But in a lot of countries, they have insurance plans. So what happens when you have um, a lot of people going out on disability? The insurance premium goes up, right? So that's another cost to the employer potentially. That's in countries, and I'll get to which countries, uh, in which countries is important to measure medical costs. I'll get to that in a minute, but it's another potential cost. Then in a lot of uh, countries, you have something called disability claims, right? That's when someone leaves the company and somehow the employer pays the cost. In a lot of countries, the employer does not pay the cost. The government pays the cost. All you have to worry about is replacing the person. But in a lot of countries like Brazil, the United States, the employer pays the cost for a period of time, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and that can get pretty expensive. And then, as I mentioned previously, you have the savings to the employees, right? So the savings to an employee would be that they no longer have to pay a psychologist or a lawyer or a financial consultant out of their pocket. So it's always good to calculate that too. So this slide shows a bunch of things, a bunch of costs that are impacted by the EAP, uh, by an EAP related issue. The question is, how do you quantify these things? You know, we know they're there, we see them, we see them in my PowerPoint, right? But how in the world do you calculate these things? All right, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, before I explain how we calculate things, I want you to know all the things we have to consider in an ROI calculation that I've already discussed previously in the previous slides. You have to know the number of employees covered and the PEPM, right? With these two numbers together, you can calculate what they're paying you, right? So 1,000 employees times $24 per person per year is a 24,000 per year. Then you have to think about the prevalence rates of issues in the company. Prevalence rates also, as I mentioned, they vary by country, but they also vary by employer. So if you have a Tibetan monastery, chances are the prevalence rates of people working there is very low. But on the other hand, if it's some senior executive for a high pressured consulting company, the prevalence rates of issues might be a lot higher. So the prevalence rate not only varies by country, but within a country, it varies by industry, right? Then you have the utilization rate. And also you have to calculate in, in, in a way, how do you calculate the productivity losses due to absenteeism and presenteeism? How do you calculate the cost of employee turnover? How do you calculate the cost of accidents and medical treatment costs and so forth? Then you have something called that we're all familiar with in our field is the dropout rate. So someone has an issue, you talk to them, and then they disappear off the face of the earth. Well, that's a cost because you're doing something, you're working, but they're not coming back for help. So there's a lot of dropout, there's a high dropout rate in the EAP programs in general. So the, the decision maker at the company is thinking, yeah, but I hear no one sticks with it, right? They, you, they hear that. So you have to say, yes, indeed, a lot of people don't stick with it. But nevertheless, it still generates a positive rate of return. But you have to at least mention it. And then something that you probably never see very much in your own life, well, maybe you will, but, but the decision maker is thinking it. They're thinking, I could pay this EAP provider $24,000 a year, or, and they won't say this, I could invest it in Nigerian treasury bills. They're thinking it, but they won't say it, but they're thinking it, believe me. So what you have to do is, is in the calculation say, I know what you're thinking, that you could probably invest this money better elsewhere. But what I've done is I've discounted that. I've considered the fact that you could get, say, 6% or 5% in Nigerian, um, Nigerian treasury bills, and I've considered that. And even with that, you're still doing better with us. So some <coughs> things are not said by decision makers, but they're thinking it. Believe me, I see it in their eyes, right? So you have to consider all these types of things. Okay. So let's get back to a question I asked previously. Should you include medical costs or insurance premiums in the calculation? Well, it depends on the country. So employers in countries with national healthcare system, where all the employees are sent to the public healthcare system, whether it's good or bad, but they're sent there, right? Doesn't matter. Like in Australia, has an excellent healthcare, public healthcare system. Whereas in Brazil, good luck, right? I'm not sure what it would be in Nigeria. But in any case, the, the important point from the point of view of the employer, they're not paying that cost. 
So they don't really care. Well, they care, but they don't care, right? They don't care financially because they're not picking up the bill of an employee going to see a provider uh, independently in the public healthcare system. So you probably wouldn't include medical treatment costs as a savings to that employer since the public system is picking it up. Uh, there are some companies in the world that are, are called self-insured. What does that mean? It says the employer has said, I pay too much money to that darn insurance company, so I refuse to pay them any more money. So what I'll do is pay all medical bills out of my own pocket. Well, uh, that company better have a good prevention program, right? But in any case, certainly you want to consider the medical savings in that type of calculation. And then, of course, there's some companies that just have an insurance plan. So every time someone goes to the hospital, it's not like the employer pays the bill. What happens over time is that the insurance premium goes up. So you have to consider just the impact on the premium, not on the medical bill. So these are some examples, depending on the country that you're in, where you, whether you consider medical costs or you don't. So how in the world do you measure these things called productivity losses? Right? I think I created a riot. So, okay. Uh, sorry, Louis, I've muted everybody. Can you just unmute yourself and go on with your presentation? Louis, can you hear me, please? Hello? No, I've opened. Hello? Can you hear me? Sir, you can unmute him as the host, sir. Yeah, I'm even looking for him on the list. Okay. Hey, I'm no longer silent. That's good. All right, go ahead. Okay. Let me get back to my slides. Okay. We talked about this thing called productivity losses, right? Which is really presentism and absenteeism. Those are the types of productivity losses that we have. So how in the world do you calculate that if someone takes a day off to treat, to take care of their personal problems, or even worse, they're distracted 50% of the day or 20% of the day sitting at their desk, how in the world do you calculate that cost? Well, if they're absent, you would think, oh, well, it's the cost of their salary per day. But as you see in a few minutes, it isn't salary. If, you, if, if people only produced what they are paid, you'd have a big problem at a corporate employer because they, they never make any money. So if I hire someone for $100, they better be producing 110 or 120, 500, depending on the industry that they're in, right? In order to make money. So it's not the same as salary. So what is it, in other words, if it's not exactly salary? So I'm gonna answer that question in a few minutes. But most EMPs don't have what it costs an employee to be out with absenteeism and presentism because it varies by industry, by occupation, by region of the country, right? Sometimes what EAPs might do, and it's okay, no, no problem, is use a multiplier. So they'll say, well, we pay this person $100. Well, let's assume that they're producing 1.3. So you multiply the $100 by 1.3, you get 130, right? And so they say that's the productivity cost per day of this person being absent. Nothing really wrong with it. It's, nothing, it's not very sophisticated, but it certainly can be done. So no problem. So it's one way of doing it. But the idea, the point I'm trying to make here is that you have to assign a value to that employee being out for an hour or being distracted for an hour. Now, as you see in our software, for example, we have productivity losses for every country we operate in. So we know that number. But the important point I'm trying to make here is that you can always use a back of the envelope type calculation and simply say, let's do a multiple of our productivity. Sometimes what you do at corporate employers, you go in and you should say, what is your gross sales? And they say a million dollars. And you say, what is your profit margin? Oh, it's 20%. Okay. So what they produce is the uh, $1,000 minus 20% and use that as the, and divide it by the number of employees 
It's a very simple calculation to come up with their productivity. So it can be done. Okay, but the important point, what is more important, presentism or absenteeism? Well, based on hundreds of ROI simulations, reductions in um, productivity losses due to absenteeism and presentism are the largest contributors to ROI compared to accidents and everything else. However, between the two, absenteeism is less important than presentism. Presentism is really important on behavioral issues. Not so much in physical ailments. If someone is absent due to diabetes or influenza, then absenteeism is more important than presentism. So if someone has influenza or, well, I suppose they're distracted because they have a runny nose and things, right? But if someone breaks their leg or something like that, they didn't have much presentism, they go running to the hospital. So they have a lot of absenteeism, right? So physical ailments have a lot of absenteeism, Behavioral issues have a lot of presentism. Okay, so how in the world do we know what the reduction in presentism and absenteeism are when employers start using an EAP? So, and then uh, the next question would be, even if we knew that, well, how much do we reduce all that due to the EAP? And then how do you measure that? Well, we have an answer for you. Some of you might heard of something called of the Workplace Outcomes Suite. Uh, my company, Chestnut Global Partners, which seems to develop and give away more than it makes in money, <laughs> developed this instrument to be used by the world for free. So here in Brazil, we have this questionnaire that we put into our call center system. And as a case comes through, you know, case someone calls into our call center, after we introduce ourselves and understand the issue, we ask five questions, not necessarily in order, and not necessarily as you will answer the question, You're, not that. We, we, we go about it very, very gingerly. For example, as you'll see in a minute, one of the questions is absenteeism. We don't ask, do you take time off from work because of your issue? They'll never answer the question, right? So we'll say something, dear Maria, um, it looks like you're really concerned about this issue and you're taking some time off to visit some psychologist. So over the course of the last month, how many visits you made? Oh, I made two. And is the visit an hour? Yeah, it's about an hour. Oh, okay, so would you say two hours per month? Yeah, two hours per month. See how you answer the question? So we have this questionnaire, and this questionnaire is, is now used by over 400 EAP vendors. And as I said, it's for free. And there are versions of it in different languages, right? English, um, Portuguese, uh, uh, Greek, uh, German, and so forth, right? So it really, it's, a, it's just five questions. And it deals with work absenteeism, work presentism, work distress, people not, like, not liking to go to work, they feel stressed out, engagement, and life satisfaction. So here's a picture of the little questionnaire. It's hard to see in this little slide, but the first two questions deal with, uh, for, the, for example, the first question would, say, would ask, for a period of the last 30 days, how many hours have you taken off from work? And then the second question, is my personal problems have kept me from concentrating on my work, agree or disagree in a, from one to five. Five being I strongly agree and one being strongly disagree. The other three questions are interesting uh, about uh, stress, um, satisfaction and so forth. But since I can't quantify them in terms of finance, money, I usually just use the first two questions, absence and presentism, to move ahead with my ROI calculations. Now, I should note that Morneau Chappelle, which now owns Chestnut, modified this questionnaire a little more to include something from the Harvard um, uh, work productivity scale. So they improved it a little bit. So we'll be making the change in Brazil. So these five questions are in our call center system. And at the right time, we ask the questions. We don't ask the five questions right in a row because we'll scare people, right? So we ask them over time, in other words, uh, and not so, in such a hard way how to answer these questions. So we have them answer these questions during the intake. And then after we resolve the issue, or we think we, resol we resolved the issue, we'll ask these questions one more time. So you get a pre and you get a post. So what we do is then compare the pre and the post to get the reductions in absenteeism and, present in, and presentism. So there's a little, and by the way, if you don't want to do these statistical calculations because they look pretty complicated, um, Morneau Chappelle is more than pleased to run these calculations for you. What you do is you send your disguised data. We don't want names of anyone, nothing like that. 
So you would just say, my EAP had um, uh, 400 issues last month. Uh, here are the scores pre and post. And that's it. Or you can do it by client, right? You don't have to even give the name of the client. We don't care. Morneau doesn't care. It, why is it trying to obtain this data? So it can run this analysis worldwide to figure out whether EAPs are doing a good job worldwide by country. So there are two EAPs in South Africa, for example, that are now going to begin to using the WAS to be able so we can get some better data on South Africa. We have great data for South America, North America, Europe, China, Australia, New Zealand, but we're kind of weak in Africa. So any of you that want to start using this questionnaire, please uh, talk to me or send me an email after. So in any case, getting back to the presentation, we have the reductions in absenteeism. We also do the same analysis to get the reduction in presenteeism, right? So now guess what we have? We have reductions. We have improvements, right? So we're getting a little closer to being able to calculate a number. So let's go back a bit. 22% of reduction of what is what? So we have to know what the cost was before so we know what the cost would be after, correct? So as I mentioned previously, most employers don't have sufficient information to calculate productivity gains from an EAP. So although they're very diff different types of methodologies to calculate productivity losses, and I gave you a shortcut before, right? I said, take the salary and multiply it times 1.3 or 1.4, or whatever it might be, and bingo, you have the productivity contribution of a typical employee, right? However, in our software, we have databases for every country, and we know what the productivity loss looks like. But first, a little bit of lecture. I, I started talking about this before. So what is productivity? So I'm gonna give you one, one slide education on productivity. So as I said previously, it's not labor and salary. That's what you pay a person. But then you have something that the company contributes. What is it? Machines, right? So if a person is working on a farm and they just have a shovel, they'll produce so many tomatoes. But you put that person on top of a tractor, they'll produce a lot more tomatoes, right? But the same thing in factories, you have machinery. Same things in cultures. Sometimes you have employers who have a good work team culture. So for the same number of people, they produce more simply because of their culture and their efficiencies. So it's the two combined that produce the output of a particular employer. So this is a database for South Africa. It's just an example, right? So what we do is we look at the GNP, that's the gross national product of, of South Africa. We divide it into the different industries, mining, agriculture, manufacturer, export, exports, whatever, right? And we're able to figure out the productivity contribution per day of an employee. So now what you see here is that we're beginning to pick up all the little pieces of numbers that we need for our calculation, which I'll get to in the next few slides. So what do we do with all these numbers? How do we calculate the gains and reductions in absenteeism in present, in, and presentism um, for a particular employer? So let me give you a, a simple example about um, how to calculate uh, the productivity uh, costs of absenteeism and um, presentism. So let's suppose we have this employee who is depressed or he's stressed about an EAP related issue, right? And they don't get any treatment. And they miss kind of one day from, uh, from work each month over the course of three months to visit a psychologist, to deal with their problems at home, uh, to deal with legal issues, whatever it might be. And let's assume from that chart I showed you that their productivity contribution is $400 per day. It could be anything. As I said, it varies by country. It varies by industry, right? But let's suppose for this example, it's $400, great. So the cost of lost work due to, product, due to productivity losses would be $400 per day times the three days they're absent, it equals $1,200, bingo. So we've calculated the cost of absenteeism. Now let's do presentism. It's very similar. Assume that same person or a different person has depression and they're stressed about work and they're distracted 20% of the day for three months or 90 working days. And let's suppose again that our friend has a productivity contribution of $400. So the cost of lost work productivity would be the $400 per day times 20% of the day they're distracted times the 90 days, bingo, 7,200. Look how much larger the 7,200 is compared to the 1,200. Now, the total productivity loss would be the sum of absenteeism and presentism. So we take the 1,200 from absenteeism, 
we added the 7,200 for the absenteeism, and bingo, what we have is the cost of the productivity cost for this employee over a period of 90 days. But without that $400 per day, you're kind of dead in the water. So as I said previously, what you do is you take the salary and you multiply times a, a ratio of productivity, 1.3, 1.5, 1.9, depending on how productive the company is, and you come to that number. So now you have um, two numbers, right? So how do we convert all this into a number? Well, first of all, as we did already in the previous slides, we've looked at which costs are impacted by an EAP. We talked about productivity, which is absenteeism and presentism. We talked about turnover cost. So we have to figure out what does it cost to uh, replace a person? When you replace a person, there are several costs that you have, right? One would be training cost. So you might ask the director of the company of human resources, how much does it, does it cost to train a person in your company? And they'll say uh, 5,000 Rand or something, whatever it might be. Oh, okay. Do you pay relocation? No, not in our company. We hire from the local labor pool. Okay, so that's zero. Yeah, it's zero. Oh, okay, good. Um, do you spend much time interviewing? Well, we spend an hour or two interviewing candidates. Oh, okay. So then you calculate what that is, right? So, and then you ask, would you have a lot of accidents? Are accidents very costly in your company? And they'll answer, well, we're a mining company. Of course, it's very expensive. So what does a typical accident cost you? Well, a billion rand. Oh, okay. So you, you ask, you ask these questions. Okay. So you move on, right? Just keep asking the questions. And so you gather all your data. And then what you have to do is figure out what these costs are before the EAP and after the EAP. So you subtract one from the other to get your savings, right? So that's the methodology in five steps. So let me give you an example, specific example using productivity again. Again, I would use the same approach if I were doing training cost, relocation cost, uh, disability cost, medical cost, and whatever cost it might be, I use the same math, right? The numbers are different, but I use the same math. So let's start from scratch. Let's start from the beginning. Suppose an employee has an issue and they're distracted, which impacts their ability to focus on work. Okay, so people also generate absenteeism from visits to providers and presentism due to distraction. We've covered that in the slides, great. Okay, so according to various studies, the prevalence rate of issues in the United States is 25% of EAP related issues. It varies by country. For example, Australia is 26%, uh, Brazil is 47%, Central Europe is 42% more or less, right? Yes. South Africa is around 28% if I'm mistaken. So each country has it, and we can come up with that number for you, right? So uh, let's just go with the 25% uh, rate right now for the United States. We'll use that in our example. And we also know from a study done by a famous a guy who I'm really friendly with, who's great, he's an incredible. He really knows more about EAP statistics than any human being I've ever met alive. His name is Mark Attridge. He says that according to many studies that he's done, that employees with issues have a presentism rate of 12.3%. That means they're distracted about 12% of the day. And they're usually absent about 1.5 days, over 90 days. So that this person takes an hour off here, an hour off there to deal with their issues. You add it all up and it comes to 1.5 days every 90 days. So let's use his numbers. Let's do a case for the United States, for example. I'm using US numbers, but again, it varies by country. And we have data on absenteeism and presenteeism by most countries that we deal with. It's different. Okay, so I'm also going to use that daily, that uh, productivity contribution database that I showed you previously. I have one for the United States. So what do we do? Oops. So the formulas are pretty simple. What we do is we say the absenteeism productivity loss for uh, before the EAP program would be the daily productivity loss, say $200 times the number of employees with issues, 25% have issues, right? Times 1.5 days, that's absenteeism. Presentism would be the daily productivity losses, say $200 per day, times the number of employees per, with issues, again, 25%, times the 90 days per episode. It takes about 90 days to take care of an episode of BAP, generally speaking. Some people say 60 days, 30 days, but usually it's about 90 days, times the presentism rate, okay? And so what you get, I'm trying to get down to the end of my slide. So what you do is you add absenteeism to presenteeism and you get a cost. So let's use an example with numbers. 
let's suppose we have this company, this employer, that has a thousand employees. And let's suppose the prevalence rates of issues are 25%. That means 250 employees will have issues. And let's suppose their productivity per day is $500. And let's suppose they're absent 1.5 days to handle the issues. So if you multiply the 250 times the 500 times the 1.5, you'll find that the cost of absenteeism is $187,500. Good. Now let's move to presentism. Again, let's suppose we have our 1,000 employees. The prevalence rate of issues is 25%. The number of, of employees, therefore, with issues is 250. Again, the productivity loss is 500 per day. The presentism rate from that Mark Gathridge study is 12%. An average episode is 90 days. You multiply the 250 times 500 times 12.3 times 90, and you get $1.3 million. Look at the size of that presentism compared to absenteeism. Believe me, if it was a physical ailment, it'd be the opposite. But in behavioral issues, presentism is really high. So, it was able, so we're able here to calculate the cost of presentism. We simply took the number of employees that, that work for the employer, right? That you may have a typical client. We looked at the prevalence rates of issues. So what you would do for Nigeria is look at the prevalence rates of depression and issues in Nigeria. That's in your literature. So you get the number of employees that you expect to have issues at that employer, 250. The productivity loss per day, as I said, you can multiply the um, salary in Nigeria uh, for the employer times a ratio of 1.5 and 1.6. So you get your number. The presentism rate probably equal in Nigeria as it is in other parts of the world because presentisms don't vary very much because human beings are human beings are human beings, right? We're all distracted the same way, in a sense, because we're all the same type of human beings, right? 90 days, that doesn't vary much across the world. It takes 90 days to solve issues. But if you believe it's 60 days to solve an issue, or you're the super duper EAP, or you solve all issues in 30 days, use 30 days. You multiply those numbers, bingo, you have a number for your employer in Nigeria. So you add the two numbers together, and bingo. We have the cost of, um, we have the total cost of productivity loss before you begin intervening. Now, now comes the EAP. So we've told the employer, look, you should be scared. The total cost of productivity was 1.5. Are they going tonight? We are sleeping. going to the this night. Yes, it's Okay. So we have the total. So we have the total. So we have the total. Shall I continue? Antonia, please mute your mic. So we have the total cost of productivity without the EAP. So the employer looks at this number and says, Holy God, wow, look at the size of this number. It's big. So EAP, what are you going to do about it? How much are you going to reduce this $1.5 million? So, um, so what you're going to do is calculate that. So how do you do it? So how do you calculate how much you're going to reduce the $1.5 million? So again, it's very similar to the calculation to get to that number. So let's do it again. Again, we have 1,000 employees. The utilization rate was 5%. Don't forget, we can't help employees that don't use the EAP, right? Okay, so let's suppose your utilization rate was 5%. Five, 5 so that means you're only helping, even though there are like 200 employees with issues, you're only helping 50, right? It's the only ones you can help are the ones that you helped. You can't help those that didn't seek help, right? So somehow we have to make that 1.5 million up on these 50 little employees. Think that's possible? Well, let's see. So again, we have this 50 employees. Their productivity contribution was $500 per day. Again, they were absent 1.5 days. So the potential absenteeism that you could reduce was 37,500. That's the total maximum if you are 100% effective. But you're not 100% effective. In fact, according to the WAS, you're only 45% effective. So you multiply the 45 times the 37,000 and bingo. So we're reducing the absenteeism by $16,000. So now let's do presentism again. We have our 1,000 employees. You're only helping 5%. That's the utilization rate, so we're helping 50. Again, their productivity contribution was 500. Their presentism rate uh, from the Amak Atrius study was 12%. The episode was 90 days. So you multiply all those numbers together, and you're reducing absenteeism by 267,000. 
But again, that's the potential. But again, you're only helping 40%. So you're only 40% effective, according to the WAS, the Workplace Outcome Suite, right? Okay, so let's be fair. So the reduction is 110,000. So if you add the 110,000 due to uh, reduction in uh, presentism to the 16,000 reduction in absenteeism, you add them both together and reduced it 127,000, right? So you say, well, is that good or bad? So what you're gonna then do is divide the 127,000, right? By what they paid you for the program. And you're gonna see that your ROI is pretty good. So you take, so you take the 127,000, that's just for productivity. Again, you have reduction in what? Accidents, replacement costs, training, disability, depending on the country, medical cost, and I can go on and on and on. So all I did here was simply add, I simply provide the savings on productivity, but there are other savings. But you can use the same approach to calculate the savings in training cost, the savings in accidents, it's the same math. It's the same math pre and post. So, um, and then I wanna spend a few minutes that I something I discussed previously, that we save money for the employees too, because they don't have to pay out of their pockets for visits to psychologists and to um, financial advisors and to lawyers. I know in some countries, the psychologists are provided for free, depending on the healthcare system, that's good. But I've never seen a free attorney in my life. And I've never seen a free financial advisor in my life, right? So depending what your EAP covers, there's some savings to the employees. And so there's a way of calculating the savings to them also. And we counsel, we counsel all our uh, employees to provide a savings to the employees so that the human resources benefit can say to the employees at the end of the year, because of our dear EAP program that we have, we saved you, our employees, um, 1 billion rand last year, or we saved you $124,000. It's amazing how you can increase utilization rates that way because everybody wants to know they're included in the crowd, right? So the same, well, other employees got these savings, why not me, right? So it's a good announcement to make to the employees. So how do you present ROI analysis to clients the first time? So first of all, you arrange a conference call. Oops, I'm back here. You arrange a conference, you arrange a conference call because of COVID or you go there personally after COVID. And you want to say you want to introduce people to an ROI calculations. Believe me, any chief financial officer or any decision maker would like to have something from you guys. Anything. Believe me, they don't see anything. So if even if you come up with a back of the envelope calculation with the assumptions, which I'll show you how to do that in a few minutes, and let them question your assumptions. No problem. No problem. Uh, and so what you want to do is get them to participate on changing the assumptions. And I'll show you that in a minute. That's a trick I always use. So, you know, a chief financial office will say, well, I disagree with that number. And you'll say, oh, okay, what number would you like? And they'll say, well, I think training costs should be uh, 20 Rand rather than 200 Rand. Oh, okay, fine. I'll be back in a minute. And so what you want to do is get them to participate. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So first of all, you arrange uh, a presentation and or you can ask them for some preliminary numbers, how much does an accident cost you and so forth. Uh, you prepare one, one slide with the initial assumptions, which I'll show you in a minute. And then you provide a summary report or an estimate. Don't forget, sometimes you're trying to justify your EAP programs, but sometimes you're trying to sell an EAP program to a new prospect, right? So what you do is you come in and say, well, I don't know anything about your company yet. I know how many employees you have, but we don't know much about you. But let me show you what our typical ROI is for other clients that we deal with. And so you come in and you show what you've done for other clients in terms of numbers. So what do I show clients when I present? Well, I show, um, I show, for example, this PowerPoint. I'll show, in this case, the United States, I'll say you're located, this is the US government, by the way, you're located in Washington, DC, which is South Atlantic, you're in government. Um, I put the daily productivity loss that I've calculated using a back of the envelope calculation or my database. I put in all the assumptions that I used. I assume that relocation cost is zero because I didn't know what they would be. I assume retraining costs would be zero because I didn't know. Don't, I'm not worried about the ROI, believe me. It's gonna be very positive. I know that, you know that, but they don't know that, right? So what you do is you put as many zeros as possible because you're, all your gains are coming from presentism and absentism. And then later on, if they object and say, but we have replacement costs here. And you say, oh, that's nice, how much? And they'll say, they'll give you the replacement cost. That will just improve the ROI and you don't need it because the, the ROIs on EAP are quite high. 
So I put a bunch of zeros in for accidents, training, and so forth. And then I show what the um, number of employees who are replaced with issues, that's a turnover. Usually in, in, in most employers, about 10% of the people who leave are due to EAP related issues. Um, and then I'll put my assumptions in, as you can see here, just reading down the slide, a number of employees with EAP related issues and so forth. So all my assumptions are here. As I said, the decision maker or the HR could dispute these numbers and you say, fine, good. What do you think they should be? What you're trying to do is create a dialogue. And what you're trying to do in these slides and the PowerPoints that you show is educate them. Remember that point I made previously that what you're trying to do is educate your clients as to what the benefits of an EAP is. It doesn't matter exactly what the number is. That's not important. What you're trying to say, do you agree that it affects distraction? Yes. Do you agree that some people leave the office to deal with their issues? Yes. Do you believe that some people leave the company because they have um, an issue? Yeah. Do you believe that people who are distracted get into accidents? Yeah. Do you believe, and so forth. What you're trying to do is get people to nod, yes. You're acknowledging, acknowledging that these are costs. The trick is later is to show how you calculated the cost. But most people look at an EAP as a benefit, as something good to have. It's more than good to have. It generates a very positive ROI. So your goal is to get them to nod yes, and then to agree on the number. Once it's their number, you're set. You want to start with your number and end with their number. Once they start providing numbers in your calculation, you're just about there. Let them do the calculation, right? We're trying to educate them. So then you show the reductions in absence in presentism. Where do these numbers come from? My boss. Remember that workplace income suite that I showed you? It showed that the reduction of absenteeism and presentism were 69% and 22% respectively. And I show that in my boss presentations. I show them with my little slides showing the reduction in absenteeism and presentism. So it came from empirical data. We asked people. And we assume reduction in accidents and so forth. And that comes from studies, like Mark Attridge has these studies that show that generally speaking, EAP reduced the accidents uh, by the accident rate by 10%. Not all accidents are due to distraction, obviously. Someone can trip over a electrical wire, right? So, but 10% of all accidents are due to EAP related issues. 10%, it looks like 10% is the magical number. It's just a coincidence. 10% of employees who leave are leave because of EAP related issues. So even if the employer disagrees with you and says, well, I don't believe that for a minute, I think it's 1%. You say, oh, okay, we'll go with 1% then. And then you do your calculation with 1%. Don't worry about it. Your ROIs will be very high. I know we're reaching the end, but what I want to show you is that you show the statistics in terms of what you reduced in productivity, uh, accidents, replacement costs, retraining costs, and so forth. And then you divide what you save them by what they paid you, right, for the EAP program. You divide one by the other, and you get the rate of return. In this case, it was 78%. So that means for every $1 or one rand or whatever they gave you, you, got, you gave them back 1.78. So what I'm gonna do is jump very quickly because I only have a few minutes before we get to the rest, but you can actually calculate if they say your PEPM is too high, you can actually show them how high it can be before the cost benefit becomes one to one. That's called break even, right? So uh, you can actually start increasing your PEPM to show them that even if you're charging $2, that you could charge $9 and you still break even. And if they say that your utilization rate looks a little low, at 5%, you calculate using 1%. And if you get to a cost benefit of one to one, that's your break even. So that's a simple way of describing break even to you. And to give you an idea of what these numbers look like, so let's suppose I did a study in Australia, and what I did is I kept the PEPM the same, but what I did is I increased the utilization rate. But normally in Australia, the utilization rate is 6%. Look at the rate of return of 412. But even if I go down to 1.28%, the cost benefit is almost one to one, right? So I could decrease the utilization rate tremendously and still have a break even, uh, break even EAP. And the same thing with the cost, the PPM. I started with $25 and I moved up to $121 and look what happened. At $121, they still get a break even. So you don't need much in EAP. You can have a very low utilization rate and you can have a very low and very high PEPM, and it's still worthwhile because of the reductions in presentism and absenteeism. So I did a study worldwide, and it shows no matter where I go in the world, for example, uh, whether I'm in Asia, Latin America, uh, the United States, 
Um, the re absenteeism from the, this comes from the workplace outcome suite. I remember how I mentioned that if you send your numbers to Morneau, they'll digest them for you. What they do is they take these numbers and aggregate them by areas of the world to come up with these numbers. So they're able to do studies on the effectiveness of an EAP by area of the country. And we're very weak in Africa, by the way. So as I mentioned that previously, so that's why we're so interested in getting work, workplace outcome suite data from countries in South Africa, even if it's only one or two of you, at least it's better than what we have. So we have, um, so what happened worldwide, if you look at EAP, and I've done this analysis across many countries of the world, you get these internal rates of return or ROI of 448%, 342%, in the United States, 459%. Over the years, my biggest problem has not been trying to show a positive ROI for what we do in our life and behavioral, it's trying to get the number down. <laughs> because right? no one believes me. So what I try to do is make the numbers as worse as possible. And that's why I was so frivolous about putting zero for accident costs, zero for training costs, and so forth, because I know all the gains are coming from presentism and absenteeism. So I try to get the number down as much as possible rather than as up as much as possible. But it also shows you in the world, we're undercharging for EAP, way undercharging, right? Um, so we could be charging a lot more for what we provide as a service. So the takeaways, uh, EAPs generate expense reductions in a variety of areas of the world. Based on hundreds of simulations in various countries, by far the reduction in presentism generates the greatest savings and, and thus is the largest contributor to ROI. EAPs generate an attractive ROI in most countries. Even modest utilization rates generate attractive ROIs. It is possible to calculate the minimum utilization rates needed to break even. It's possible to calculate the savings to the employees and out-of-pocket expenses. And the business value from an EAP should be announced to all employees periodically to gain support for an EAP. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'm ready to answer them. Louis, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Let me just take you on. You and I were talking and we were looking at areas that we will partner going forward. But then uh, I will want to encourage us as a nation to send you or to ask you to help us with the workplace uh, outcome suit for productivity, absenteeism, and presenteeism in Nigeria. Uh, especially for us practitioners in EAP. You and I will look further into this, carrying along EPA Nigeria, so that we can begin to generate data for our practice here. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And what I'll do is I'll ask um, the Ivan, who is now in charge of the WAS for Morno, to send you the latest version. It's very good. They've made a tremendous improvement on productivity, the way they ask the questions. So I'll ask him, I'll copy you on an email to him and ask him to send you the new instrument and the PowerPoint presentation that goes along with it, okay? Thank you, Thank you very much. And I will share it with my colleague with your, uh, with your permission. Okay, I will, no problem. At any All time, right, just distribute it worldwide. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Todebi, uh, Secretary, do you want to please take over the question and answer session? Well, thank you very much, Reverend. And um, a great applause for you, uh, Dr. Savisio. We are going to be having question and answer, and uh, I've already seen one in the chat. And the question was about pension. So the individual would like to know how do we maybe factor pension into all this. Pension would be retirement benefits? I suppose so. Pension, pension would be, uh, would I understand pension as being your retirement benefit? Well, Hello? Also, also, I'll, yes, like, I'll, we didn't mention anything about pension, why? Probably we need some emphasis on this. Well, pension, I assume you're referring by pension as a retirement benefit. Is that correct? So 
to the degree an EAP related issue has someone leave work um, for a period of time or even a lifetime because of severe depression and things like that, then of course it would affect the point of view of the employee. It won't affect uh, the pension of the employer, right? Because the employer doesn't, um, the, the, one person is equal to another person. So it's gonna be paying pension to someone anyway. So I don't think it's, it's very too relevant for the calculation from the point of view of the employer, right? They're more concerned about productivity, replacement costs, accident costs, things like that. Now, medical costs is another story, and I'm not sure of the system in Nigeria, but I assume it's a public system, that not many employers provide medical insurance privately. So that's another story. But I don't think, to answer your question, I don't think pension is too relevant from the point of view of the employer. It's certainly relevant from the point of view of the employee, right? Thank you very much. That taken. Um, members who expect questions from you so that we can learn and share from the rich experience of Dr. Sadizio. Well, I have a question here and I want you to attend to this time. Thank you, Louis. Will you Thank think statistics from India? Our company is of a great benefit in ROI computation. I will go through it again. Thank you, Louis. You Will you think statistics from individual company? Statistics from individual companies is relevant, is of great benefit in ROI computation. Or will you prefer a national productivity approach? Okay. That's another question. Um, I can do a calculation from the point of view of the employer or the point of view of Nigeria. Now, Nigeria, for example, as a country, and this applies to any country on earth, if I were to look at Nigeria as one giant employer, <laughs> right? It is, which combines a different, I, I have, for example, for Nigeria, I know it's easily to obtain the national productivity of Nigeria. So I can do a calculation quite readily, knowing the population of Nigeria and the percent of people that use an EAP or don't use an EAP to look at the opportunity cost. It's, e it's, it's pretty easy for me to calculate what Nigeria as a whole would gain from dealing with EAP related issues. I've done that for uh, in the past with vaccines and other things like that. From the point of view of Nigeria, of course, they're concerned about uh, productivity, right? Uh, by from absent from absenteeism and uh, presentism. It all impacts the country of Nigeria just as much as it impacts an employee. So yes, it is very possible to look at, to look at Nigeria as one giant employer. Now, you have to keep in mind that several people, uh, several types of individuals not may, may be considered quote unquote productive. I know that my wife would, would be very angry at me if I did not call her productive. If she doesn't work, she'd probably throw something at me immediately. But from the point of economic productivity, they're contributing indirectly. For example, a student in school, are they productive to the economy? So what I generally do to avoid those types of arguments, I divide a country into those who work for industry, that would be the national employment rate, right? As reported by Nigeria, Nigeria has this number, and that's the number I work off of, recognizing fully well that even though people are not working for a formal employer, that they're still contributing to the nation indirectly. But what I do is I separate those calculations completely. I run into those types of questions, for example, with vaccines, right? If you have a vaccine, it helps an employee go to work. Great. But on the other hand, if you don't vaccinate someone who's at home, their wife or kids, guess what happens to the employee? They also catch influenza by going home. So what you have to do is look at things nationally. But what I generally do to answer your question, I usually look at the people, number of the employment rate of Nigeria and calculate the benefit and productivity to the country as a whole, looking at Nigeria as one single giant employer, which is an average of your industries. Well, thank you very much, uh, Louis. And it might interest you that the biggest employer in Nigeria is actually government. Right. Oh yeah, and so I, as you, the analysis showed you, when I was showing that PowerPoint previously, guess what that is? That is Washington, D.C. employer. 
So that analysis I showed you previously was an ROI for the government. So the government of, of the United States has an EAP. Believe me, it's a big EAP, <laughs> but it's an EAP. I would love to have that contract, by the way, but that's another story. So um, they, I did that calculation for them, for the U.S. government. So yes, it's possible to do a calculation for the U.S. government if someone had a national, if they have a national EAP program. Should um, you, if I may come in, if you will permit me to come in, uh, Louis, I know you have practiced in Asia, in the Americans, uh, in Europe. In Africa, for us in Nigeria, how do we begin? Who should be, should we be more, uh, uh, which model should we be borrowing from? Well, the model, the, the calculation is the same no matter what country you're in. There's just two differences. I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the ROI now. I'm talking about the EAP practice itself which is uh, more ideal for us? Is it the, oh, the PPM? Or the, well, the, as far as I know, there are two EAP models, right? One yeah. is the you charge a PPM, right? Per employee per month. And the other, like you have a lot in yeah. South Africa, would be the internal, um, the internal department that has an EAP, right? Now, the yeah. difference in approach is that usually an EAP with a PEPM is external. It's a vendor that does it. Yeah. Whereas the, the internal is the company invests money in a group of psychologists and social workers, gives them an office, a telephone, air conditioning, overhead, um, and uh, advertising budget, marketing budget, right? So what you yeah. do in that case is you add all those costs up, right? And you come to a number. Say it's um, the equivalent of $1.2 million or whatever it might be, right? That's what the company, the employer is investing in the AP. So the second question would be, okay, good. How many people actually use that department services? That's the utilization rate. So what I then do is calculate the gain divided by the total cost of that operation, rent, salaries, benefits, telephone costs, electricity, mail, marketing costs, et cetera. That becomes your ROI. So it can also be done internally for an internal EAP. All right, so thank the you. The numerator is always calculated the way I showed you, productivity gains, accident, reduction in accidents, turnover, et cetera. The denominator, instead of being PEPM, is really the total cost of operating that EAP internally. Okay. Uh... Hopefully, I will be able to get you to Nigeria at some point uh, so that we can have, you can have a one-on-one -on -one interface with uh, the people in Nigeria, the players, EAP players in Nigeria. I would love to. It would be, a, um, it'd be an honor to go there. It'd be very nice. All right. So we, we will work on that and maybe ask you to be a presenter at our conference. That would be great. I'd love to see Nigeria. All right. At your own cost, of course. <laughs> well, maybe if, if in South Africa, I can take a plane over Nigeria. That would be fine. I'm just joking with you. But sure. it, it, can, it can be arranged. Okay. <laughs> well, as long as you show me your local sites and uh, some local food and local drinks, I'm all oh, ears. De definitely we'll do that. Okay. And then, I mean, I'll also ensure you get uh, a souvenir for your wife. I know that you always do every year. Yes. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> and that would be well received, too. She enjoys them. All right. Thank you very much, my dear friend. Uh, okay. I, I will expect your mail with the link for the uh, WOS. OS. Uh, we will also be open-ended to receive whatever resource you can give to us to grow EAP in Nigeria. It is still very much at its infancy, mm -hmm. very much at its infancy, and we need help from the world over to grow it and to teach our people. Uh, this will be one of many 
uh, invitation to you to educate uh, and uh, train so that we can enhance our EAP skills and competency. Uh, sure. Maybe a bit better way of doing it is educate the market rather than just your EAP. So invite a lot of heads of HR departments and heads of companies to be able to look at EAP in terms of as an investment rather than a cost. So that might be workouts. So you have one conference for EAP and one conference uh, for the the employers of Nigeria. HR, HR people, yeah. You are very yeah. right. But we need to put our own house in orders first mm -hmm. before we start uh, inviting other people. That'll be fine. All right, my colleagues, the potentials are huge. We have not even done anything yet. Uh, let us come together, build up this profession, and uh, we all stand to gain a great deal if we succeed. Uh, we'll call on the secretary to please say the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Reverend. And uh, the credential of this gentleman, Louis Antoine Avisio, was read at the beginning. And it's not just impressive, it is heartbreaking in the sense that it covers the whole globe. So we have just taken nugget of experiences from different parts of the world. On this note, I say a big thank you to you, Dr. Safisio. We, it's a great privilege having you. And one thing that you have heavily trained me about here, well, let me start that. It might interest you that last week, a friend and a client asked me, how do you calculate ROI? And it turned out that we'll be doing it this way. Interestingly, the person himself is hearing you. So oh, wow. it's a big take on for us, and we will still need to hone our skill in this area. And we always realize that we can call on you. Another thing that you said, which is heavy for me is, EAP is more than good to have. We have been underselling our EAP. With this, you have reposed us with confidence. Dr. Louis Antonio Savicio. If only you can see through our chat room, you will see a lot of appreciation on that. We want to thank you. We say we appreciate you so much. We look forward to having you again. Our regards to your family. Have a thank great you day, very sir. Much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank uh, let me just make an announcement. Please arise Thursday, the 15th of October. Thursday, the 15th of October for our next learning event. The speaker will come from India. Her name is Nastrin Engna, and she will be talking on post-COVID-19 formula for professional success in the new normal. In the new normal. Formula for professional success in the new normal. Thursday, 15th of October, our next learning event. Please derive that date. Uh, again, I want to thank every one of you, my dear colleagues. This has been a very good outing for us. I have learned a lot, uh, and it is a privilege to be part of the op Organizing, uh, organizing this outing. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. A pleasant evening and a restful night, I wish you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Venerable. Uh. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Venerable.